I've mentioned it in passing. I want to take this little prophet. Oh, what a wonderful prophet he is. And I want to speak to you about him. You can easily find him. It's the last book in the Old Testament. And I want to take this, reestablish its text a bit, because the King James Version has some very archaic forms, and there's so much more known about Hebrew today than was known in the days when this was translated. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Today, instead of burden, we'd say the oracle. The oracle, the speaking of God, the message which God gave. How God has spoken to Israel by Malachi. And then there's a dialogue. God speaks, Israel speaks. God speaks, Israel speaks. First of all, God says, I have loved you, says the Lord. And Israel says, how have you loved us? Isn't it strange that man should say to God, how have you loved us? How do we know you've loved us? Now, it's true they lived before Christ died. They should have known, they should have comprehended, they didn't understand. We today, of course, know. We can see the love of God in the cross of Jesus Christ. But before that, it took a whole lot more faith for them than it does for us. When Jesus said, Abraham saw my day and was glad, Abraham had, a, had, had to have a whole lot more sense to see Christ's day than we do to see Christ's day, because we have it in history. Abraham merely had his hand stopped as he was about to kill Isaac, and God had to say to him, Abraham, there will come a time when I will offer up my Isaac, and when I lift my hand to strike him, there will be nobody to stop my hand. And Abraham cut the cords and took Isaac with him, and he said, Lord God, dost thou love me like that, that thou wilt strike thy son for me? Yes, says the Lord, I do. And yet isn't it true that by people's actions and words and deeds, they, they say, how have you loved us? True, these men lived before the time of Christ, and so we'll excuse them a little, and yet God didn't excuse them too much, as you'll see. The only way I know that God loved me is I see it in Christ. If instead of putting the stars in the shape of the Big Dipper and of Orion marching across the sky, if God had arranged the stars in English, I love you, man would have had a right to say, God, if you've loved us, why didn't you do something about it? God says, I did do something about it. I came down. I came down to your level. I lifted you and took you back for me. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Isn't it terrible that God has to remind us that he's loved us? Well, you loved us. And God said back to them, wasn't Esau Jacob's brother? Yet I have loved Jacob. Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. The problem for me is Jacob have I loved. Because you study the life of that crook and you say, but how could God love him? God says, I loved him. Well, well, that I don't understand. Esau was hateful. He should have been hated. But the miracle is Jacob have I loved. Never forget, my dear friends, that the miracle in the Bible is the love and not the hatred of God. The only logical thing in the whole Bible is hell. Nothing else is logical from the point of view of sheer logic. That God should let you live the way you live and think towards him and then say, now I'm going to give you this and take you to heaven too. That's not comprehensible. Sometimes people say, I don't think there's a hell. I say, well, if you were a legislator, would you introduce a, a word into the a law, into the legislature, providing that any man found guilty of stealing $5,000 or more should be provided by, for by the state with a life pension and given an estate in Florida? Why, well, of course not. He should be put in the penitentiary. Well, isn't it strange? And yet you think that any man can be a sinner, and that when he finishes sinning, God says, come on now, here's your estate. You've gone ahead and done your sinning, so now I take you into heaven. Why, no, the logic of crime is the penitentiary, and the logic of sin is hell. 
And the giving of a criminal, the giving to a criminal of an estate and a pension is totally illogical. And the giving of heaven to you and to me has no logic in it at all. Except the divine logic of love. And that's our God. And so they said, how have you loved us? Why, God said, look, go back to Jacob and Esau. Didn't I love Jacob? I chose him. And he sets forth Esau as the example. And he says, I've laid waste his hill country, and I have left his heritage to the jackals of the desert. For God had done this. Esau had lived over the border, across the Jordan, just outside the boundaries of the children of Israel. And God says, I've seen to it that war passed over his country, and I have laid his mountains and his heritage, his hill country, all the places where he lived. I've left it, says God, to the jackals of the desert. The Hebrew words translated dragons, it's simply because of the fact that they, in 1611, they didn't know the meaning of too many words. Nowadays, they believe it was the jackal. doesn't make any difference. It was some wild animal. Now, if Edom says, because the whereas is a, a word of doubt, if Edom says, we are impoverished, literally we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins. And that's the way man often is. God sends a judgment. Man says, I'll build it up again. We will return and build the desolate places. Well, then the Lord says, well, you may build, but I'll tear down. And I'll keep on doing it until people shall call them the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. God says, these people, this Edom, this Esau, this people beyond the border, the way they've sinned, God says, I must show my righteousness. Now, someone might say, well, it's mighty pleasant for the Jews that God blessed them and mighty hard on the children of Esau. It's all right. You've got to face up with the fact someplace along the line that the sovereign God does what he pleases. Now, he should have sent everybody to hell. Don't ever judge him because he does send some people to hell. Oh, how many people there are that say, but I don't think God should, and then they bring God down and measure him in their own stature. As I've frequently pointed out, God made man in his own image. Then man turned his back on God and has created a God in his own image, and he's always in trouble with him. And the difficulties and the doubts that people have about God are because they have a God that's smaller than themselves and that has to be subject to their reason. But when we come and submit ourselves to the God of the Word, in the Word of God, then everything becomes very, very simple. And God says, there is a people there, you're Israel, and I say, I love you. And this dirty, low-down people, because Israel was dirty and low-down, just as dirty and low-down as Esau. From a human point of view, there was nothing to pick and choose between them. And I rather suspect that from a divine point of view, there was nothing to pick and choose between them. For in Deuteronomy, God says, if you ask me why I chose you, I didn't choose you because you were any greater. I didn't choose you because you were wiser. I didn't choose you for any other reason than that I chose to choose you. It pleased me to choose. I think that's not why God has made the human race the way he has. Have you ever seen a man walking down the street with a woman and say, well, what on earth did she ever see in him? Well, she did. And that's the way God made the human race the way it is, because he wants us to say, what did you ever see in me? He saw me ruined in the fall and loved me notwithstanding all. And as we say, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, so is love. And the fact that God loved you and me is because God is love. And as far as I'm concerned, I'll stop my doubting there. And I'll say, oh, Lord God, I deserve to be over on that side of the fence with those that are judged and hated. But here I am. And I'm never going to say, how did you love me? I know, because I've seen Christ. And here he says, 
Here's a stubborn people over on the other side of the border. There's Esau. I've wasted their land. And they said, we'll build it up again. Well, God says, I can tear down faster than you can build up. I can judge faster than you can repair the breaches. They may build what I will tear down. And they shall call them. And there's the word until in the Hebrew. They shall build, but I will tear down until... They shall call them the border of wickedness, or the wicked country, the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. And your eyes shall see, he now turns to Israel, it's a very emphatic word, your own eyes shall see. And ye shall say, you Israel shall say, The Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel, or literally, great is the Lord beyond the borders of Israel. God is not only great inside the borders of Israel among his people, but God is great over the frontier. God is great in his love with us, and God is great in his judgment over there. And then God comes back to his plaint against the children of Israel. A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? God says, I'm, I'm the father of you, Israel. Have you treated me like a father? You say the Ten Commandments, honor thy father and thy mother. Well, have you honored me, says God? No, you haven't. A servant honoreth his master. You call me master? Adonai is the Hebrew word, Lord. You call me Lord? But where is my fear, the proper respect and dignity that a servant owes to his master? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests who despise my name. And now he speaks to all Israel and especially to those who stood before him because there are some people that have an advantage over others. The great principle, you know, The Lord says, to whom much hath been given, much shall be required. Well, much has been given to us. More than to any people in the world today and more than to any time in history. I was riding recently with a group of men and we were rolling along the road in a lovely car. The man was driving us and I said to the group, stop and think what we have in comparison with Julius Caesar. Suppose he who went 2,000 miles in a chariot over a road that was filled with ruts. Suppose he had a a jalopy to do it in. My, he would have thought a Ford was the most magnificent thing he ever seen, let alone a Cadillac. Hmm. All that we have, and I told them the story I've often told here, how Caesar kept several thousand slaves to bring ice from the glaciers in Switzerland. And every night, every night, every night, Throughout all the summer months, slaves started, dozens of them, with 80 pounds of ice on their back, and they ran. And they ran as fast as they could run for an hour, and they put their pack on another man's back, and they ran, and they drove those slaves all night. And before the sun rose, they had pits where they put sawdust over the top, and they buried that ice during the day. And as soon as it was dark the next night, men ran, men ran. And when the ice blocks had melted down, Enough, they'd put two of them on the backs of slaves and they'd run them in so that Caesar could have a couple of hands full of dirty glacier ice from Switzerland. And you fuss if the drawer sticks in the icebox clay. Oh, people of blessing, never have so many sinned against so much. All of you have slaves that work for you. You walk in and reach around, click, and there's light. And it would have taken two slaves working all day to prepare that many uh, branches and rushes for you to burn and that amount of olive oil to be beaten, to be burned in lamps. And you don't have to go to the store every few hours for just enough for one meal because they had to kill things fresh. There was no refrigeration in the world. You can lay it up. You've got a refrigerator and packaged goods, and you complain, and everything is brought to you. You sit at a table, and you've got coffee from Brazil and sugar from Cuba, and you've got oranges from Florida and pineapples from Honolulu, 
and asparagus from Carolina and everything before the time and you complain because something is a little tough. Never have so many sinned against so much. And God, therefore, just as he would charge us with greater sin than that nation, so he charged Israel with greater sin than he did Edom, and he charged the priests with greater sin than he did the people. Because they were chosen by him and entrusted with the lamb, the altar, the blood, the sacrifices. And he comes now and speaks to them because they were the leaders of the people. And notice, he said, O oh, priests that despise my name, I am a father and you have not honored me. I am a master and you servants have not obeyed me. You say, wherein have we despised thy name? Ha, oh, says God, you've offered polluted bread upon my altar. Well, what do you mean? Wherein have we polluted it? Why, says the Lord, by thinking that the Lord's table may be despised, that the table of the Lord is contemptible. And if you offer the blind for a sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and sick, isn't it evil? See, the Lord said that the lamb was to be without spot and blemish. But what they had done, well, it's like the story I read when I was a little boy. Most children, young people of our day never saw Noah's Ark. But in my day, when I was a child, one of the commonest toys was a Noah's Ark. You had small ones with uh, 15 or 20 little wooden animals of different kinds, and you had big ones that might have 50 pairs of animals. And there was Noah's Ark with all the animals, two by two, cut out of little pieces of wood. And one time there was a story that children had a couple of, uh, had a, a Noah's Ark for Christmas. And along early in January on a rainy day, the children were playing inside and they wanted to play with Noah's Ark, so mother let them put the stopper in the bathtub and they filled it up, and the flood rose on the surface of the earth, and there was the ark and the flood. And after they were tired, a while they pulled out the plug, and the waters abated on the face of the earth, and the ark came to rest upon Mount Ararat sponge. And the mother was in the next room, and she heard them talking and said, What do they do now? And sister, little sister, said to brother, They offered a sacrifice. Well, let us offer a sacrifice. Well, what shall we offer? And so they took all the animals out and put them in a row, and finally they said, let's offer up this camel with a broken leg. Now that is a trait that is fundamentally in the heart of the whole human race. There has never been the treasurer of a church that hasn't found streetcar tokens, especially from Chicago and Cleveland, if anyone happens to get one by mistake. There are buttons in the offering, Canadian money, if they get it, that's where it goes. Oh yes, I know, there are many people that give and that give sacrificially. Yet, let's face it, by and large, all the way, we are prone to give that which hurts, hurts the least. It'll try to salve conscience and yet go through the gesture. God had said that when they offered a lamb, it was to be without spot or without blemish. God says, when anybody gives me anything, it must cost him something. For I want him to comprehend what he's doing. And God never demands anything of any man that doesn't have some personal sacrifice in it. There has to be some cost in it for the man who wants to walk with God. And you will discover that as you go on and you come close to walking with God, right away there'll be something that demands a price. That's God's way. But we're prone to do what the priests did. They offered a blind animal for sacrifice. Is that no evil? When you offer those that are lame or sick, is it not evil? Ha! Go and give that as a present to the governor. Will he be pleased with it? Why, says he, you wouldn't dare offer to a governor what you come and offer to God. Would he accept thy person? Now, if you went to the governor and wanted some favor, and you knew that the governor was collecting lambs, and you went and bought him a nice one for his flock, and then said, Governor, I wonder if you could appoint my nephew to such and such a place, why, he might do it. But if you came 
with some broken-legged or blind beast and said, Here, governor, will you offer it? Get out of here. Well, says God, now entreat the favor of God that he'll be gracious to us. <laughs> You've brought me blind lambs. You've come and given me the dirty thing all the way through, the unclean. And now I pray you beseech God that he will be gracious to you. And this has been the means that you've done with such a gift in your hand. For that's the, the for way this should be translated. Instead of saying it, and now I pray you beseech God that he will be gracious unto you. It's you entreat a favor from God that he may be gracious to you. <laughs> and with such a gift in your hand, this hath been by your means. With such a gift in your hand, will he regard your person? Will he show favor to any of us, saith the Lord of hosts? Then it asks here, who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? And you'll notice that the word is there and for naught in your Bibles are in italics, which means they're not in the Hebrew and are put in to make sense. But the whole sentence has to be retranslated. For it's not a question at all, but a great cry of desire. Oh, that there might be someone among you who would shut the doors so that you do not kindle a fire on my altar in vain. It's the equivalent of God saying, Oh, that there might be someone who would have courage to go and shut and lock the church door to, people, to keep people from going in church and being hypocrites. That's the idea. It's back. Oh, says God, that there might be somebody who would come and say, I'm shutting the door so that you can't bring a blind sacrifice. I won't allow you to bring such a thing. You shall not pollute the house of God. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts, neither will I accept an offering at your hand. It was hypocritical. God had to deal with the nation. For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name is great among the Gentiles. And here God points out, that over the borders in Edom, where he had thrown down their cities and turned their gardens into wilderness, they recognized and they said, God, God did it. But you, says God, I judge you, and you go back and try to get around it. But God says, I'm going to be blessed. I am going to bring to pass that which is the glory of my name, for I am God. And I will be worshipped in my way. How horrible it is that we should ever have to say in our national documents, let every man worship in his own way. No, 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 no. Certainly, yes, we believe in freedom of religion. But once more I say, let us understand freely that when we speak in America of freedom of religion, from the point of view of the Christian, it means the right of every man to go to hell in his own way or to go to heaven in God's way. That is freedom of religion. And it's the only freedom of religion that any Christian can ever say that he's interested in. We never be, need to be afraid of what any men teach. Just give us liberty to proclaim the truth and the truth will take its own way and defend itself. That's all we want. The word of God is living and powerful. The same right that gives them the right to go and hold a street meeting and say nonsense, nonsense, and nonsense gives us the right to go and say truth, 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 and truth is enough. You never have to defend a real lion. Just let it loose. And so says God, my name is going to be great. My name will be great in every place. I will magnify myself. I am going to have a pure offering, for my name shall be great among the nations, saith the Lord of hosts. And then he comes back in this closing paragraph. He said, you have profaned it. You profane it when you say that the table of the Lord is polluted and the fruit thereof and even his meat is contemptible. They acted that way by bringing cheap things to God. He said also, behold, what a weariness this is. And you sniff at me. Isn't that like people? Oh, Sunday morning, I've got to go to church again. 
There are lots of people that way. Oh, I know some of you love to come to the house of God. But by and large, let's not forget, there are millions that say, oh, got to go to church again. What a weariness, what a weariness. And in many places, it is really a thing that is abhorred to have to come to the house of God time after time. Go sometime in a restaurant when a radio is playing and when a change comes from an ordinary program to a religious program. I've had it happen more than once. I remember once a jazz program was playing in a barber shop. I was sitting getting my hair cut, and all of a sudden the change came, and out came the gospel. One man says, shut that blankety-blank thing off. And I said, will you please leave it on? I want to hear it. And since I was a customer and he was a barber, they had to listen to it. Oh, what a weariness, says Malachi. He said also, what a weariness, what a weariness. And you sniffed at it. You sniff at me as the Hebrew, not at it. And in the Hebrew, very definitely, that says, you sniff at me, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring that which was torn, and the lame, and the sick, and thus you brought an offering. Should I accept that from your hand, saith the Lord? But cursed be the deceiver, the cheat who hath in his flock a male a lamb, and voweth and sacrifice unto the Lord a corrupt thing. He's got it, says the Lord. Now, suppose a man didn't have anything but one little blind lamb. Oh, says God, I'll never turn away from a man that only has a little blind lamb. If that's all you have, you bring it. Oh, says God, if you came into a place and you didn't have any money and you had nothing but a Cleveland, Ohio streetcar token in your pocket, and you said, Lord, I don't have a penny tonight, but I do have that token. It might be worth two or three cents, but I, I put it in. Oh, says God, praise God. Isn't that Cleveland streetcar token wonderful? You see, isn't that wonderful? Oh, says God, but cursed be the cheat who has the male lamb, the ram, and who voweth and sacrifice unto the Lord a corrupt thing. Oh, says God, what I don't want is that you say one thing and do another. For I, and then God speaks about it, I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts. And my name is dreadful among the heathen. That is to say, my name causes dread, awe, wonder, godly fear among the nations. And the answer, the, the thought is this. If out in the world people say, God, how about you who have been redeemed, who name his name? Should you not comprehend that he wants your whole heart? The conclusion is this. This is the Old Testament story of Ananias and Sapphira. For Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament sold a lot, kept back part of the price, and came in the church singing, I surrender all. And God struck them dead. God says, when you come to me, I want you to come to me with your heart. I don't ask of you to give beyond that which you want to give. If when you come to me, says the Lord, you can choose. If you come before me and say, now, Lord, I've got $50. But I really need a new coat, and I really need this, and I really need that. So tonight, Lord, I'm giving thee a quarter, and, and that's, I give it out of my heart. The Lord says, that's wonderful. I love that quarter. I love that. But he says, if a man has $50, and he doesn't have any need for it, and in his heart, there's the thought, now you should give $5. You should, you should, you should, you should, you should. Yeah, I know I should, I know I should, but there's the quarter. And I says, God, that's the thing I hate. I'm talking about those things, material things, as an illustration of the spiritual. Let me put it this way. If some of you have a heart that is far from God, and you come in, and you say, well, God, here's $50. 
God says, that's a blind lamb. Give me your heart. But Lord, there's fifty dollars. That's a lamb with a broken leg, says the Lord. I don't want your fifty dollars. I want your heart. That's the thing that he's talking about. 